God is doing and very thankful for Ark because Paul is a church planter and for those of you that don't know us, before we relocated to South Africa, George, five years ago, we lived in rural Zambia for 10 years and uh, actually started a church planting movement there. So Paul was in his element, but we also always wanted to plant and lead church in South Africa. But then Greg and I had some conversations and um, when someone's a church planter, they're a church planter. And I quite like George. <laughs> and I believe in church planting, but I'm so passionate about church growth and just wanting to see the church grow and been quite nervous that we would go plant a church somewhere else again, wherever in the world, you know. And um, when Paul discovered Ark, I was like, go for it, go for it. Because now we can be part of others planting churches and it will just actually be, actually be so much bigger than She was really than nervous that we'd have to move every two or three years. Yeah. Fun and games. <laughs> Fun and games. <laughs> but you know, I've heard us say the best is yet to come so many times yesterday and this morning. And when we say the best is yet to come, we're not just being positive, right? We're not, not just excited, positive people. What we're really saying is, God, you are on the throne and you hold the whole world in your hands and we believe you are a progressive God. That's what we're really saying. We're not just being positive. And we've just learned that God is so progressive. And we, we declare that all the time. Our church is going to grow because God is a progressive God. In fact, we believe church growth is a command. We believe God has commanded us to grow the church. And it's not an option we can consider. It's a command we need to obey. And God is on our side. He's not against us. He's for us. It's His church. We believe God is more committed to our church than what we are. And it's just been absolutely exciting. So we've learned a few things just in the past five years about church growth. So at the end of this month, our church, Hope Church George, will celebrate its fifth birthday. It's exciting. There's some of our team there, and it's our first birthday, so it's sort of a theme, and it's going to be high fives and good vibes. This is so cool. Um, but we're so excited about celebrating our birthday and celebrating what God has done over the past five years. When we arrived in George five years ago, we weren't as excited as we are right now. So we're in Zambia, where we, where we lived, God's done incredible things, and we still oversee the Zambia project, and, uh, but moving back to South Africa was a big deal for us. It was clearly God who guided us. We knew God spoke. So when we arrived in George, we knew that's where God wanted us, but people were saying things to me like, oh, so you moved to a small town now, and... Zambia and what God's doing there is so big. We literally every day see people who's never heard the name of Jesus give their lives to him. We would go into villages and say, have you heard about Jesus? And they'll say, mm, mm he's never been here. Um, we would see kids that were literally dying, it's lives saved, you know? And now we moved to a small town and we, we basically relaunched a church there were about 50 people in the church, and... All out of debt. Just was in debt. <laughs> it was small, and there were a few really nice people, but then there were some people that really didn't like us and, and weren't, weren't very nice. And we knew it's where God wanted us, but the best way to explain it is I felt demoted. <laughs> I thought, God, what did we do wrong? We were building your kingdom, and now you're like, I thought we were like, it's getting better and better, and now you, we're like. Well, you know, if you're faithful with a small, God's going to trust you with more. So we've been faithful, and, and now. <laughs> we were both just building this awesome work for God, and now like, 
why a small town and is this what's going on? And the Saturday night, just before our first Sunday service, I said to God, God, I just need a word from you because I'm not excited. And if I'm not excited, Paul's not going to be happy. <laughs> you know how it goes, happy wife, happy life. And I was like, well, what are we doing here? And it's a big deal to move your kids and to move your whole family. In fact, our kids had such bad speech problems because of living in Zambia that they had to go to speech therapists. Nobody could understand them. It was just a big deal. It wasn't an easy move, you know. And there's so much purpose in Zambia. So I, I cried out to God and said, God, I need to hear you say something. I know it's, I don't need to, to, you to tell me that we're in your will. I know we're in your will. I just need you to say something to me. And that night we were sleeping and at two o'clock, this is Saturday night before the first Sunday, I woke up. I'm wide awake. Normally, Paul wakes me up snoring. It's true, I do snore. And then I just push him a bit, and he's like, sorry, sorry, and then he rolls over. But he was so quiet. He wasn't snoring. And then I thought, one of the kids, one of the kids must be coughing. And I'm listening. No one's coughing. So I thought, there must be a dripping tap or something. Nothing. And then in that silence, God spoke to me so clearly. Like, the best way to explain it is a clear, almost audible, spontaneous thought. Prepare the nets for a great catch. I mean, hello. <laughs> Prepare the nets for a great catch. So I'm like, pull, pull, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. This is actually very exciting. So God just said to me, prepare the nets for a great catch. Lots of lost people are going to get saved. And God's going to do incredibly big things. And you know... We've, we're learning so many things about how to grow our churches, and it's awesome. We need to learn from each other, and we need to implement. I mean, I'm, we're going back. We're going to listen to each session again, and we're going to, one a day, <laughs> and then make notes and implement as God guides us. But nothing can take the place of hearing God's voice. You the know, book of... That's, it's critical, you know, we can, we can do everything that we're supposed to do, but it's, and learn everything that we can from so many other, and we need to do that, but it's never a substitute from hearing from God. We have to spend time with God, we have to hear from Him, because it's that hearing from God, it's that voice of God that carries us through those difficult times. And so, for us, the first few months, years in, 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 um, in George, it was, it was difficult because we'd go and try to meet people like, you know, you're trying to plant a church, you're just trying to find everybody that you can and go to different parents' meetings or go to like the farmer's markets and try to speak to people and get, try to conversation like, oh, where are you from? No, no, we're Hope Church. Oh, I used to go to that church. I, I knew so-and-so had an affair. So-and-so took money from this one. And we were like, <gasps> oh, we've heard about that church. Well, some people would say, oh, now we, isn't that church cursed? And so those voices kind of coming at you the whole time, and you have to choose to not hear another voice. And you say, no, no, God's told us. No, God's told us. No, God's told us. Um, and just that, that hearing from God carries us through those difficult times. And it, it activates you, you know, because now nothing can stop you. So the next day we had to stand in front of the church and introduce ourselves, and now we were excited because we knew we need to prepare the nets for a great catch. And that means lots of lost people were going to get saved. So God speaks. He's a relation, relational God. He actually he created us for relationship with him. And we should expect to hear his voice and listen for it. And it is just so powerful because now nothing can stop us. <laughs> we could stand in front of a church and say, God's got such a plan for this church. So many lost people are going to get saved. Yes, we know our churches need to grow. We know it's God's will for our churches to grow, but when God speaks to you personally, when he wakes you up in the night, there's just something about his voice that is so powerful. So, and God is a God that speaks. He loves to communicate, and so it's not something that we think, oh, maybe it's not going to happen to me. If we expect it, if we trust in God, we say, God, I, I'm, I need to hear from you. We believe that he will, because that's what he loves to do. Why don't you tell them about the time that we yeah. went into yeah. a new building phase? Yeah, so we were in a building that could seat max 180 people. And we knew straight away as we arrived in George, prepare the nest for a great catch, that's too small, right? So we started pursuing a CTM building right around the corner. And Paul will share a bit later how we actually got that building. But to stay on my point is, 
again, we needed 2.5 million rand to be able to prepare this warehouse to, to move into. So we, we got the lease, we were going to rent the building, but now we needed 2.4 million and our church just got out of debt. <laughs> and Paul and I, we, we shared the load and he was gonna preach the next Sunday or that Sunday, it was again the Saturday night, and I had to stand up and tell the church we need 2.4 million, but praise God, we're just out of debt, you know? Um, <laughs> we need it quickly, because we need to move in, you know? So, I really needed a good fundraising idea, and something that would get people excited, and I could think of some ideas, but I don't know, nothing good enough came to my mind, and as I was praying on my bed, I actually saw 1 Chronicles 28. <laughs> so I thought, 1 Chronicles 28. I've never read the book. I don't know if it's bad to say, but I've never read Chronicles. <laughs> I know Jeremiah 29 verse 11. I know John 10 verse 10. There's so many verses I know. and She likes the New Testament. There's yeah, like that. totally. And when God brings back verses, it's incredible, right? Because the Holy Spirit, you store it up inside of you. But Chronicles... I was like, okay, that's way out. Maybe I had too much pizza, but imagine, imagine there's something in there to get the 2.4 million. <laughs> imagine, it's just too random to not be God, but I can also sometimes imagine things, but that was pretty much, pretty much white and black, you know? So I thought before I tell a soul, let me just check it out. But up, true as Bob, um, uh, you probably all know Chronicles, but it's all about David giving instructions about preparing the temple and getting the temple ready. And this is basically what I read. David also said to Solomon, his son, be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. The divisions of the priests and the Levites, to me it's just really the people, are ready for all the work on the temple of God. And every willing person skilled in any craft will help you in all the work. So the next morning I woke up, I had so much confidence. I stood up and I said, you know, I prayed last night. We wondered how we're going to get 2.4 million. And uh, God gave me this verse. <laughs> and basically we feel we equipped. We believe there are people here that's willing and skilled to help us until it's all done. So what we're going to do tomorrow, if you feel that it's you, our church at that point was about 500 people. And we said, if you think it's you, if you've got some skill or some willingness to help, please come on Tuesday night, that very Tuesday night at 6 o'clock. And then we'll just see how we can brainstorm together as a church. A hundred people rocked up. <laughs> we had to move to another venue because we prepared something small, you know. And this one was a plumber. He was going to do all the toilets. The next one had a painting business. He would give all the paint. The next one was a landscaper. They would do a garden. Oh, we can have a garden. Awesome. Okay, we'll take a garden. And another one said, well, I've got laborers. I've, I can drop 50 people here every day. <laughs> it was actually just incredible. Within three months, the whole place was completely renovated. <laughs> completely renovated. And it only cost us 400, it only cost the church 400,000 rand. Everything else was donated. And if some of you have been to our church, it's amazing. It's really phenomenal. So we can't take credit. It wasn't our strategy. It's just us. We need to expect to hear God's voice, you know? Because sometimes we think it's too good to be true. But he does speak to us, and we need to tune in and, and be excited about it. So on our first birthday, we, we're celebrating currently. We're around 2,000 people on a Sunday. So in, two, in five years' time, God has done so much, and we continue to prepare those nets because God's a progressive God, and His church is going to continue to grow. Yay, Graham! Awesome. <laughs> but there's a verse that is probably, you know, I think we have like life verses. So this is one of my, my life verses, and um, it's a verse in the book of Matthew, and traditionally, this is probably the most 
This is one of the verses that is, when it's translated into the English language, it loses it. And if you read it in different translations, it emphasizes different parts of it. That's because it's written in the, in the Greek. It's written in both the positive and the negative at the same time. And this is Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. This is from the New Living Translation. It says, And from the time that John the Baptist began preaching until now, the kingdom of, give, of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and violent people are attacking it. Some translations will say, and the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence, but violent people are advancing it. So it's almost like, like, well, what is it? Is it negative or is it positive? But the truth is that it's both positive and negative at the same time. In other words, it would be 100% true if we translated this verse and we said the kingdom of God is suffering violence. Bad people are doing bad things to the kingdom of God and is losing ground. Bad things happen. And the and bad people are the ones that are doing it. That would be 100% true if we said that about that verse, or we deduced that. But also, it would be 100% true that the kingdom of God is forcefully advancing. It's advancing forcefully, and those that advance it are the ones that are forceful. Let me say that again. The kingdom of heaven, this verse says, that the kingdom of heaven is forcefully advancing. It's not advancing by itself. When it advanced, it's advanced through force. And those that advance his kingdom are the ones that are forceful. The ones that don't take no for an answer. The ones that are willing to fight. And I'm absolutely convinced that we as leaders, we as church planters, we as church leaders have to have that fight inside of us. We have to have that, that sense of un, that being, almost being angry with the state of what's going on in our world. The fact that there are people outside of our church that are not saved. No, that's not right. We need to do something about that. So while we praying and looking to try and get this building, the CTM building, we, it was for sale. We tried to buy it. It, couldn't, it was crazy money. We couldn't, couldn't afford it. So a Muslim guy bought it. Bought it. But we'd have kept on, we, as a family, we'd drive past it and we'd stop with our kids and stand outside. We're going to pray and we'd pray for the building. And God, we believe in you, believe in you. And sometimes I would go into the shop and, and walk around and uh, people would think I was a bit strange. They're like, hey, you want to buy some tiles? I'm like, no, just looking. You're looking again. How can I help you, sir? Are you sure you don't want a toilet? Fixated on tiles. Fixated on tiles. <laughs> but you know, this building is, was right around the corner from our other building on the main road, on the corner with big billboards already perfect up there. Location. It's like perfect for a move because everybody just basically have to walk 10 extra steps yeah. <laughs> to get to church. So we, we had our minds absolutely set on it. However, the building can now only seat 720 people. So we're moving from 180 seater to a 720. Then the option came, well, should we buy the building? But in my heart, I'm thinking, well, if we buy the building and it seats 720 people, then, then that's all we're going to be. No. If we buy that, then we're limiting what can happen in the future. So everybody in our team is like, no, no, you need to buy the building. You need to buy the building. It's a good deal. Yeah, but it's a big jump off from 100 And I'm thinking we don't have money anyway. <laughs> so I'm like, no. So we start praying. We start looking for this other piece of land. There's another piece of land in town. Amazing. It's 16 hectares. It's opposite the mall. It's beautiful. So while we're signing the lease agreement on this building, I've got my eye on the next building, on the next piece of land. And people think, you're crazy. But I'm like, no, we've got to fight because it's not about us. We need to advance the kingdom of God. So this thing process goes on. I meet the farm. I start talking to the farm. I start finding out. We start finding out about the different people that own this, that have tried to buy this farm. And everybody just says, you're never going to get it. That guy, you cannot deal with him. You're never going to sign it. Different developers have lost money trying to do business with him. And so we just continue to pray and trust God and trust God. And uh, two months ago, we signed for an option on the farm. And that whole journey, I'm keeping my mind, I'd meet with this farmer sometimes every week, and I'd walk away just depressed. But uh, you, you remember in, in Zambia, we had to also get land. Land's always something you need to get. And then we had to work with a king there, because it's tribal. Oh, Nduna, yeah. Nduna, yeah. And Paul had to actually go bow in front of them, begging for land, really. But he said that... That whole process <laughs> really was preparation for, for this. 
Because you really need a lot of patience, eh? <laughs> a lot of patience. And this, this guy was just so difficult and unplayable. And the different developers that would speak would say, you're never going to get that land. You're never going to get that land. But like this, we kept on saying, no, that land is ours. That land is ours. That land is ours. And uh, just on beginning of this week, actually on Monday, when one of the other guys in our church, a developer in our church, heard that we had got the land, he phoned me up. He says, Paul, Paul, well, did you get that land? I'm like, yeah, but, but Paul, that's the best land. How did you get that land? We've all tried to buy that land. How did you get it? And I really believe that. You know, God has been keeping that land for a church. Maybe not our church, but he's been it keeping our that. It is our church. Yeah, no, he, <laughs> let me finish. Let me, let me tr- a couple of back. So the, this farmer, his brother's radically saved. This guy's not saved. This farmer's brother's radically saved. And when this guy bought his farm in 1974, his brother said to him, this land that you're buying is supposed to be used for a church. And then many people from around are going to come and get encouragement and hope from this place. So that's amazing. But I don't believe necessarily that God kept that land for us. But I did believe he kept that land for his purposes. And it's us that are forceful. God's like, okay, I'm going to trust you with it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I believe God's keeping land for his purpose. He's keeping provision for his purpose. And he's like, oh, who's, going to, who's, who's going to take that city? Which of you is going to fight that fight? Which of you is going to not give up when it gets tough? Which of you is going to believe my word and take ground? And those that do get the ground. Do you know, something that I've really learned through this is that when we plan ahead, we're actually showing God we have faith. So we were literally signing lease to rent a building while we were pursuing to buy land somewhere else. People thought we were nuts. I felt embarrassed about it because big thinkers, business people would come to me and say, but aren't you planning to rent this? Why are you looking for, for land? Aren't you happy with that? I'm like, no, no, that's what we're going to rent and then we're going to build there. And they're like, we just felt like, you know, you, you feel like, what are we doing? You know, because it does seem, we just got this building. We still are like, we, not, we, we can't yet even have more than two services here and we already want to buy land. But When we plan ahead, it shows God that we have faith. And I believe that when we show God our faith, it touches his heart. (laughs) I do. It touches God's heart. And when God is touched, he moves. (laughs) And when he moves, he does incredible things. I love this, this story in Mark where, you know, Jesus was teaching and the room was so packed full of people. You couldn't even come through the doors. And then this group of guys came with their friend that was paralyzed. And like I like the New Testament. <laughs> and they actually made a hole in the roof. And then they lowered their friend on, on the mat through the roof. And right in the middle where Jesus was teaching. And then, this is what Jesus said in Mark 2 verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. When Jesus saw their faith. And it's when he saw their faith. So when, when, when God sees our faith, it touches his heart. And when his heart is touched, he's moved. And when he moves, incredible, incredible things happen. Our faith touches God's heart. And, and the question we need to ask ourselves is, what can I do to show God my faith? No matter how crazy I look or how absurd it seems, what can I do to show God I have faith? Because it's going to bless him. It's going to touch his heart, and he's going to be moved. And when he moves, incredible things happen. And I think it's important for us, we have this conviction that God is bigger than our faith, that God is not limited by our faith because God rose from the dead before we believed for us. God has been doing miracles on our behalf since before we even started praying and seeking him. But it is also true that God is moved by our faith. And so faith moves, like Marianne said, faith moves the heart of God. And we need, to, we need to pray crazy prayers. And we need to follow that up with crazy action, like knocking on farmers' doors and saying, hey, <laughs> we're looking for a miracle. We want to buy your land. Do you have money? No, but I believe this is for us. And so there's a, another passage in, um, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter chapter 3, and I think this is a great passage for, for all of us church leaders and all of us that, doesn't matter where you are in your, 
in your, in, in your journey. And hopefully what we're sharing is encouraging you, what we've learned for the last while. But it says this, this is for, that wasn't me, I promise. Um, it says, what after all is Apollos and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned each to his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. Only God makes things grow. We have a, a tendency to, to lift people up, and we have a tendency to sometimes want to lift, be lifted up because of maybe things that we've been done. And, and this passage talks about, talks about our role as leaders is to make sure that we create an environment where seed can grow, where, light, where growth can take place. We're supposed to water we're supposed to be faithful. We're supposed to study the areas that we want to grow our churches in and make sure that, that, what we're, what, that, that it's got the, all the right conditions that are conducive to growth, the environment and everything else. But we cannot make something grow. Only God, only God can make things grow. And I think that, that puts us at ease, right? It actually is relaxing because you're like God is the one who builds his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it but it is exciting to see our churches grow right you see on Sunday there's more people and next Sunday there's more people and we look at graphs and we see the graphs look exciting and you you do a, a forecast and you see wow this is exciting and you have to do a lot right for a church to grow and this is what this conference is about it's like there's a lot of things that we need to do hard work systems but ultimately it's only God I remember getting quite excited thinking we're doing a lot right you know um, our church is growing and studying church growth look at churches as growing and then again one night I was sleeping and I had a dream such a vivid dream and it it, just, it was about our second year of, of seeing God do big things in George. Paul and myself was in a, a small lecture room, and Brian Houston was our professor, and we were just sitting, and we were ready to write a test. And Brian Houston said, okay, guys, write down the top 10 things that causes a local church to grow. And as he asked the question, I took my pen, and I was like, oh, I'm going to smash the test. <laughs> This is, I can write 10 things down, which top 10, okay? And as I wanted to start writing, I, I just felt God grip me quite firmly on my shoulder and rebuked me. He said, it's all by my grace. It's all by my grace, and don't you ever forget that. So I pull out to wake up. <laughs> Am I snoring again? <laughs> I'm like, Paul, seriously, we can't take credit for nothing. It is all by God's grace. And we can never, ever, ever forget that. It's by God's grace I'm healthy. It's by God's grace I was born in Sasselberg. <laughs> and I had an education. And I married such an amazing man. It's by God's grace I wasn't born in a rural village where my mom died of HIV at birth and I was sexually abused. And we are blessed to be a blessing. And it's all by God's grace. We can take no credit that we had finances to get and resources and people that believe in us to get to a conference like this, to get the information we're getting. It's by His grace. It's all by His grace. And the, the amazing things about, it shouldn't be a revelation, right? But it should be. But it when we really understand it's all by God's grace, grace is a free gift, right? So it's not just something for a few good leaders like Greg Surratt. May I say, Donald Trump asked him to be on his advisory board. May I say that? Yeah. And he said no, he said no. <laughs> we think Greg Surratt is the most incredible, influential person we've ever met in our lives. He's Amazing. like, seriously, Amazing, it's by man. God's grace that, that we know you. But God's grace is a, a free gift, and it's for all of us. The question we need to ask ourselves, the question I ask myself is, 
Are we living in the grace God's given us? Or are we like stressing and striving to do things in our own strength? It is all by His grace. And bottom line, let's just be ourselves and see God do big things. I think that's it's such a critical point that, you know, sometimes I remember listening to this, this guy was t- talking about his father and his father was a, was a traveling salesman. So he used to go from door to door selling and how the, the market changed and how door to door salesman, you know, that, that way of selling things was less and less effective. And so he was describing his father. And so as he said, so his father had to work harder and as the harder he worked, the more he sweated but people don't like the smell of sweat. So what he was really saying is, you know, we shouldn't be striving. Yes, we need to work hard. Yes, we need to give our best, but we need to know that it's actually God that grows the church. It's actually by his grace. And we need to relax in that. We need to give our best, but we, we, let's not sweat, but let's give our best. Yeah, so slightly nervous to share about church growth because it's all by his grace, but let's hear from God and fight and never forget that it is all by his grace. Great. Shall we pray? Is that okay? Lord, I want to thank you so much, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord, that you are a God that loves your church. You're a God that loves your church, God. You love what you're doing on earth, Lord, and you, you want to see all our churches advance, Lord. Thank you that you've called us, Jesus. Thank you that you've called us, us. Could have been anyone, but you've called us and you allow us to participate in what you want to do in our world. And I pray that somehow you'll just continue to relax in you, Lord. Trust you. Fight for you what you want us to fight for, Lord. So we can see your kingdom extended. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can I ask if we put 1 Chronicles 28, verse 20 up again? It's going to come. There we go. I really feel this is something God wants to say to us all. Be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. It's God's churches, and what he started, he will complete. And God's work done God's way, never lack his supply. So he will complete it. It's true. As we were praying last night, that's not just about financial provision. It's not just about buildings. But I really believe as you, as you, as you endeavor to do what God's placed in your heart, he has already prepared people to come around you, to strengthen you, to make sure this thing succeeds. And they are going to come around you and do and help you do what God has placed in your heart. Believe that. Trust in that. Build, build on that. Be confident in that. Because God is very committed to seeing his kingdom extended. Exciting. Great. Thank what you. we're going to do now is we're going to just finish the meeting. Thanks, Marianne.